was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Ray. Praise the Lord. We're just glad to have both of them being here today and sharing their talent with us. God has blessed them both richly. And especially having Becky just step up today and uh, present special music for us. Oh, wow. That was good. I kept wanting to say, there is... Uh, no, no, no. Amazing. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Ray. I got something I want to read for you. Uh, there was one little boy in the teacher's class. This is, I was supposed to read this last Sunday uh, for D July the 4th, but I forgot it. So, uh, there was one little boy in the teacher's class who really struggled to learn. And one day the teacher asked him, who signed the Declaration of Independence? And of course, he didn't know. And the teacher asked him every day for a week, but still he couldn't give the right answer. Finally, in desperation, she called the boy's father to come and see her. She said to him, your boy won't tell me the name of the person that signed the Declaration of Independence. The father looked at his son and he said, come here, boy, and sit down. The boy kind of shaking, did as he was told. And then his dad looked at him and said, if you sign that stupid thing, just admit it so we can get out of here. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I got another one. I, I got to read this too. Independence Day was approaching and the teacher took the opportunity to teach her class all about patriotism. She said to them, you know, we live in a great country. And one of the best things about it is that we are all free. At this, a little boy marched up to her from the back of the class, put his hands on his hips and said angrily, I'm not free, I'm four. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let's talk about some great thing. What's your wildest dream for Mesquite Church? Now, as you ponder that question, you may have a dream of a place where there is joy and excitement all the time, sort of like we've had this morning. You dream of a place where lost sinners are found, broken homes are restored, and those who are adrift find new purpose in living. Now that may be happening in some churches, or sadly it, it may not be happening. And this may seem like a rather unusual place <laughs> to begin a sermon about a man named Naaman. But I think you'll understand as we go further 
Some of you are probably familiar with the story of Naaman. It's in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Let's look at it together. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. That's Aramea, or Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him, <clears throat> the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naban's wife. She said to her mystery, mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master, the king, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter with you to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending you my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? <clears throat> Can I kill and bring back to life? What does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, <coughs> he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went <coughs> with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, <coughs> Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored, you will be cleansed. <clears throat> but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned, and he went off in a rage. But his servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? <coughs> Excuse me. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean. Listen to this. Like that of a young boy. And I want you to know that <clears throat> when you translate that from the Hebrew, that that phrase, like, the, like that of a young boy, actually meant an infant actually meant skin so clean, so soft, so new, that it was like a newborn baby's skin. That's how God healed it. I thought that's amazing. That's an amazing story of what God can do and what he does. So what do we have here? Well, <clears throat> basically, we have the story of a heroic military figure who is afflicted with leprosy and is appalled when he is told that in order to effect his cleansing all he need to do is dip seven times in the Jordan River. <laughs> and like a good Syrian he didn't like that. He refuses to do what the prophet Elisha says to do until 
one of his servants come to him and says, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? That's ironic, isn't it? Many of us would like to do some great thing to serve God. <clears throat> I mean, some of us probably dream of missionary crusades to the deepest, most remote parts of the jungle and, and transforming a whole village into believers. Some of us preachers fantasize about preaching to stadiums full of people who hang on our every word, sort of like Billy Graham. <laughs> We'd like to be the Christian, some of us might like to be the Christian philanthropist who is able to fund worthy causes out of our abundance. Most of us, though, don't get to serve God in such great ways. The story of Naaman is, is actually filled with irony. At first we read that he's a heroic figure. He was a general in the Syrian army. He was very influential in bringing victory to his king. He was the Douglas MacArthur, or the Norman Schwarzkopf of his day. He was greatly admired and highly sought after. Yet, yet there was one sad circumstance in his life. He had leprosy. The Hebrew word translated leprosy here is zareth, which means smiting. In reference to a Talmudical expression that it serves as a punishment for sin. And it's quite possible that zareth was a general term for certain types of skin diseases. So he may not have been lepros leprosy, but it was, a, it was a condition like leprosy. It's ironic, isn't it, that famous people with all the fame and success and prestige, it doesn't preclude tragedy and illness from invading our lives. Think of famous people, famous people you can name who have cancer, some other disease, or family strife or tragedy that hits close to home. You may remember Farrah Fawcett, who died with cancer at the age of 62. Very successful actress with riches. And <clears throat> or how about Michael Jackson? He died at age 51, having built Neverland, his, <clears throat> his dream village. And his name was on the lips of every teenager in the, in the world. Or some of you may remember a guy named Steve McNair, who was a quarterback for the Tennessee Titans and who were originally the Houston Oilers. And he was the first African American who was ever drafted first in the NFL draft. Dead at the age of 36. Killed by his mistress who then shot herself. They all died a few years ago, but they were very famous. And then, then just recently, how many of you remember reading just today or tomorrow, or yesterday, the name of Nick Cordera? Nick Cordera was a famous Broadway star who was married, had a one-year-old child. They had just turned one. And he succumbed to COVID-19 just here recently at the age 41, age 41, after suffering in the hospital for 95 days with COVID-19, losing, having one leg amputated, and before he died was going to have to undergo a, a complete lung transplant. That disease had so ravaged his body at age 41. 
I don't know if there's anybody here younger than 41. How old are you, Ray? <laughs> Close, buddy. <laughs> Nathan, maybe. I don't know. But you know what? That's, those are tragedies. And it's ironic that Naaman was like some of these people. He had access to the finest of medical care just as they did, but alas, there was no cure for his leprosy or skin disease. Another bit of irony is that the one who shows the most spiritual discernment is a servant girl in the household of this, this king of Israel. An Israelite, she knew of a prophet in Samaria who could cleanse Naaman if only he could see him. How many times does God use the weak to shame the strong? The foolish to shame the wise. As one with political connections, Naaman attempts to go through channels <laughs> to set up, a, set up a meeting with Elisha. He has his king, the king of Syria, draft a letter to Elisha's king, probably Joram or Jehoram. When Elisha's king receives the letter, he thinks Naaman's king is trying to pick a fight with him. And he asks, why does he send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? Isn't it ironic that Elisha's king and the king of God's covenant people doesn't have enough sensitivity and discernment to know that there is a man of God in his midst who could heal Naaman. <laughs> well, Elisha heard of the king's quandary. He was kind of upset because the king has torn his robes and wailed and lamented. So Elisha said, <clears throat> have the man come to me. And he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. The people around here know that there is a prophet in Mesquite. Is there a place in Mesquite where the lost are found? Where the broken are restored? And those who are adrift are given Direction? Hmm. Do you ever wonder? Is my church known for doing that? We see a sign out here that says we're opening. The people know that when they come through the doors of this church, they will meet God and can be changed. Naaman goes to see Elisha, and he's underwhelmed. <laughs> he's really upset because Elisha doesn't come out to meet him. Elisha sends one of his lieutenants or servants and, rather than coming himself. Now, why did he do that? Well, probably because he wanted to communicate that the healing was going to come from God and not from him personally. Elisha's mode of cleansing was to have Naaman dip seven times in the Jordan River. And Naaman is outraged. If dipping in a river would cleanse leprosy, there are far superior rivers in Syria, Naaman thought. And his servant asked a question so powerful that it rings through the ages. If the prophet had told you <clears throat> to do some great thing. Wouldn't you have done it? Many of us would be willing to do some great thing in order to be right with God. But God doesn't want our great things. What God really wants is simple trust and obedience. God wants us just to do what he tells us to do. We may not be called a mega church, but we have a commission to be God's church right here, right where we are. And it's our ministry to be witnesses 
to those who come through those doors into our midst. I'll never forget one year, and I think it was in Brentwood, Tennessee, that General Assembly, our General Assembly met there, and the year before, we had commissioned this brilliant scholar from Princeton University to do a close study of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and report back to us what we could do to make our church grow and to do greater things. And I was in attendance at that General Assembly when that professor, PhD, he came back to report to us and I'll never forget what he said. He said, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church is a very small denomination. And it is not very powerful. But the best thing the Cumberland Presbyterian Church can do is the things it can do do it very well. You're small, can't do much, but what you can do, do it well. Do it to the best of your ability. That, my friends, is the great thing that God wants us to do. We may not be called that mega church, but we have a commission to be God's church right here, right now. What great thing brought Naaman's cleansing? Obedience. <laughs> he did what he was told. He obeyed God's command through Elisha's servant. And he went and dipped in the Jordan River and became well. What great thing brings us salvation? What led you to become a Christian? Simple trust in the crucified, resurrected, ascended Jesus Christ. Just trust. For by faith, for by grace, men are saved. And that through faith, not of themselves, lest any man should boast. What great thing builds a great church? Simple obedience. Just to obey. Let me share a couple of verses with you in closing. From 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. But Samuel replied, and this was to Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Disobedience leads to rebellion. And rebellion is the opposite of obedience. So, what do we do? Let us resolve to just be faithful and obey God in what He calls us today to do. It may not be some great thing. It may just be Come together and worship. Come when you can. Come when you feel safe to doing it. Come together and worship. That's, that's all God is maybe asking us to do right now. So let's resolve just to be faithful. Obey God in what he calls us to do. This pandemic could get so bad that we may not be able to come together and worship. So what are we going to do? 
Well, we're going to put the sermons online on our website like we did for 15 weeks. And we're still going to have a message and we're still going to have some music. Brother Ray is going to make, send some music out to us. We're still going to be able to worship. I mean, the pandemic can cause us not to be able to assemble here together, but it can't keep us from worshiping God. We can always worship God. We may not be able to do everything we want to do, but God calls us to do what he wants us to do and to do it well. Do it to the best of our ability. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you for this lesson from first, first, Second Kings, from the story about Naaman. We thank you that Naaman finally had the good sense to obey you. Go and, go and dip in that river. We thank you for healing him, making him well. God, we just thank you so much for how that applies to us. Help us not to look for the great things that we can do, but help us just to look for the things that you tell us to do and to be obedient, to be obedient in following the path that you lay out for us. Father, we thank you today for this privilege to be here together. And I pray for all of our folks here and for many of our folks that will be at home and will be watching this next week on, on their TVs. I pray, God, that you would keep us close to you. Help us to keep our eyes on you and our faith strong. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and God is leading you to make some kind of a decision for him, then I'm going to invite you to come up and we'll pray together. I'll be happy to pray with you as you come and we can, uh, we can get those things resolved. Brenda's going to come and lead us as we sing our closing hymn.